morning, good afternoon. This is Karen Jacobson with the NEMSIS Technical Assistance Center. Um, thanks, State Data Managers, for joining. Um, it is January 26, 2017, and um, the topic for today's uh, you know, state training session is actually more of uh, an educational overview in which I wanted to talk about the value of the state data set files, the value of a schematron file, um, and then the correlation between those two resources and the value that it offers um, to the software companies that operate in your states. Um, I asked Josh Legler to assist me um, with this today, specifically with regards to you know, how Schematron works and to um, cover some of those things. So um, I know a number of you were on yesterday's V3 implementation call, I did a brief introduction about this for the software companies. They're aware of it, but I just want to show a couple of things to you guys. Um, so I want to just do a general start by saying, um, how many of you off the top of your head know if you have a state data set file or not? So I think of the folks who are on the call, um, you know, the, the states who have systems up and running, and, and, and it's, of course, most value to have these resources if you have third-party systems operating in your state. Now, Jay Osby, who's on the call, so I'm going to go to Wyoming really quick. Um, Jay is in a situation in Wyoming that, um, although they've, you know, provided some information for us here, um, almost exclusively, or is it already 100% J that uh, all of your agencies are using the same software? 100% uh, of the agencies at this time are using the same software. However, the, the, uh, some of the places are doing dual entry, and we tell them that's their uh, business practices, and that's up to them. Okay. Makes sense. Good. Yeah. Uh, so we do have resources for a lot of folks um, who have joined the call, um, and then we have some states that um, that we don't have information for. So what I want to do first is I'm I'm, I'm going to give a couple of examples of of the information. And um, Kevin Putman was kind enough to point out um, yesterday that we have two sources resources for him in which they list all of the elements that we have in the or sections that we have in the state data set builder. So if you know if on the NEMSIS website and you know how to find the support pages, hover over support, click on V3, um, hover over V3, click on state and territory, uh, it brings you to the state map. Then once you uh, click on the state map, um, it'll let, bring you to where some resources are and identification of uh, timelines that a state has for implementing version 3. So here is the Michigan State Dataset file, and they also have a Schematron file. The naming convention um, only differs by one is called a State Dataset file, the other is called EMS uh, Dataset, and this is your indicator that it's a Schematron file. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up the State Dataset.xml uh, by right-clicking on it and having it open up in another window here. And you'll notice that we have all of these various sections to the state data set file. And most of you have seen this before. Um, we you know, have offered individual trainings. Uh, Josh did one of the trainings almost 20 months ago with regards to the functionality that this tool offers. There have been a number of updates that have been made to it. But there are um, all of these sections. Now, there will be scenarios where states may not have um, all of this information just because the state law might not require it and you have, may have a state without any custom elements. So Michigan, as you can see, um, has everything. So they have custom elements. They've listed all their el um, the elements that they want to receive plus their custom elements. Um, as a state, they they do limit the procedures that can be performed based on certification level, and similarly based on uh, medications permitted by the state. And we can go over um, how this information is entered. Um, 
towards the end if people would like. What I really wanted to focus on today was show the um, correlation between the state data set file um, and and the state data set file and, and why it's really valuable to have um, both of those pieces of information available um, as resources. Now, it's also possible that some of you might have these resources um, kind of in a draft stage and have not yet provided them to Nemesis. You might even offer them on your own websites. Um, and once those have been finalized, we do request that you share them with the NEMSIS tag so we can post them. And that if you have them as a resource um, on, a lo on your local state system, that you make those available to um, us as well, or at least let us know that to you know, kind of do a redirect um, to another page. Um, Josh, can you uh, share what the value of a schematron file is? As you know, I'd, I'd put these questions in, in here of what is it, how does it work, why should a state have one? Sure. Uh, and if you want uh, a good primer on how schematron validation works in the NEMSIS standard, if you head over to the NSEMSA website to the Data Managers Council, they have a documents and presentations page, and uh, there is a presentation in there a guide um, that I wrote a, oh, probably three years ago now. Yeah, documents and resources. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that NEMSIS version three resources section, yeah, the one that's showing up right there near the top of the page now, data validation in the NEMSIS XML standard. Uh, that's a, a useful one to, uh, to read through, it takes about 20 minutes uh, to get a little more in depth. Uh, but at a high level, uh, Nemesis data is validated using uh, schemas in two different ways. There's the XML schema that we call the XSD, and uh, so everyone's familiar with that. And so when a Nemesis document is generated, um, we test if it's valid by validating against the Nemesis. Uh, XML schema or XSD. Uh, if it passes the validation at the XSD level, we run a one more stage of validation and that's through something called Schematron. So there's a Schematron schema and the document also has to be valid according to the Schematron schema. The difference between an XSD schema and Schematron is um, how the rules are written. In an XSD, it's called grammar-based. So uh, you know, imagine if you were trying to describe the grammar of English, you would say, you know, you can have a noun and then you can have a verb and then you can have another noun, you know, something like that. And then you have a period at the end. So you describe what can be uh, and, and what's allowed in the grammar. So the XSD says, hey, this element, then this next element, and this element here can occur many times. And for each element, here's what the values are that are, that are allowed for that element. Here's whether or not it can be empty, that kind of stuff. Um, but a grammar-based validation does not handle uh, what I would say are um, arbitrary rules or rules that um, cross different elements. So, uh, for example, when you want to make a rule that says if the patient's gender is male, then pregnancy cannot be yes. Well, those are two different elements in different parts of the document. So you need a rule-based validation to come up with a rule that says, hey, we, we don't allow uh, pregnancy, yes, and gender, male, uh, in the same patient care report. And so Schematron is a rule-based validation approach and allows you to have rules like that that cross uh, across different elements and do conditional sort of uh, validation. You know, if this, then that. That's what Schematron's good for. And so that's why Nemesis uses both the XSD or, or XML schema and a Schematron schemas to perform data validation. And then the additional advantage we get is that in addition to the national level validation rules, your state can publish a state level Schematron schema that, that contains rules that you would like to enforce at the state level. So it gives us these, this nice kind of tiered validation where we say, okay, it passes the XSD schema, that's great. It passes the national Schematron schema, that's great. Now does it pass the state-specific validation rules that are in your state schematron schema. And if it does, 
then that's a valid document and it can be accepted by your state system. It puts all those rules out there in a standard format, so it, it um, eliminates any uh, kind of vendor preference that might uh, occur where, you know, someone would say, well, if, you know, if agencies use the state system, then the validation gets performed correctly, but if we're using a different system, we have no idea what the rules are, and it's like we send it to the state, and the state is kind of a black box, and it just tells us if we were if we got it right or we got it wrong but the state system doesn't tell us what the rules really are so by putting them out in this standard format now all systems can implement these rules uh, within a state on a on a you know a level playing field that um, all of the vendors can successfully implement systems in your state that where the users have a good user experience and they produce quality data so that's a just a quick uh, overview Karen Awesome. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate it. So, so as we, as, as Josh men mentioned, there, there will be, you know, some state rules. Um, so if we, if, so I've gone back to the Michigan um, state data set file. So Anne is just asking the question um, where she says, so our validation rules should be translated to our state schematron. Um, the answer to that is is yes. Um, I'll put a couple of caveats to that, um, kind of as a careful, um, but let's we'll talk about that in a minute, Anne. Uh, so if I look, for example, um, at the list of elements that uh, Michigan is indicating they want, such as crew information, um, and you'll notice I put that in uh, a little bit in the agenda for today. So most of the time. States want to know the certified personnel uh, that responded on a call. They might even have state law that says you have to have two you know, EMTs at a minimum on certain calls um, or, you know, a paramedic and an EMT, or in some cases, a county might even say you have to have two paramedics. So depending on who the regulatory authority is, um, that's an example of, of state law um, that could enforce it. So if I go now and I click on the Michigan Schematron rules, um, so this you'll notice these are all listed as unnamed pattern. Um, a little difficult to read. However, one of the things that um, Josh made um, an enhancement to is that one can look at the validation rules based on the message displayed or by an element. I'm going to um, click on element. And I'm just going to scroll down here um, to the crew section, and and these are warning messages that uh, Michigan has that says crew members need to be recorded on this incident, and crew member level is required, and then the response role is required for each crew member. So um, this is a state rule, and to your point, that has been developed so it's already as a validation rule in in the state system that Michigan has and what they have done is transformed the validation rule into a schematron rule uh, so for example saying crew member level so this again is is it's based on element but in essence this is a message um, it's a warning only there are some states that actually have the e crew information um, shown in here as a fatal rule, meaning they they probably have some state law that says you must have that crew member information entered. But if I look, just click on the three dots off to the left hand side, um, this is this is some information as it relates to how the how the rule itself was written. Now I can tell you, raising my hand here, proudly saying I have no idea what this means, right? It, you know, as a as a non-developer, I need to be able to have this option um, to say, okay, here's the element, and here's in essence what the message is. There are some rules, and we can point out some of the. Um, so, like here's one down um, here further. That the if-then statements that Josh referenced, we see these in some of the state systems. We also see these in the. Uh, the national rules that have the um, if-then statement. So here there's one that says unit arrived on scene time is required when unit left scene is not blank 
or the incident patient is not canceled prior to arrival. So if we look at this message, there's um, some, or the rules itself, it's actually putting the details related to um, the elements into the list, and then here is a specific value, um, a code representing a value from edisposition.12, which is incident patient disposition. Karen? Yeah. Um, if, if there's already something built in the national data set, do we need to do anything at the state level? So I, I'm going to answer that in two ways. Um, so there are some of the state systems that the, that the national rules that actually are XSD based. So Josh mentioned that the XSD controls uh, some of the information. Um, we have seen that either the XSD uh, rules that are enforced in saying that the element has to be there um, are duplicated either in a state system. Keep it in mind that the purpose of that would be you have a state system that um, users are able to uh, utilize directly, right? Um, so it's a user interface, um, and, and it's you. So they want to make sure that that, for example, the PCR number is entered. Um, but I could go to another state system and we'd look at the Schematron rules and we'd see a whole bunch of fatals listed. In fact, let me click over into overview by validation message and I'm just going to scroll down. They're red if they're, um, if they're fatal. The errors also actually mean that the information has to be entered. So, and we just saw this, of course, on the other page. Uh, but this is saying type of response delay is required field, which it is, right, because res response delay is a national element. And so that's saying when a unit actually responds, this field must contain an actual value. So what this is saying is don't put a not value in there. Don't, don't use not applicable or, or not recorded because there are value choices such as none. So if there wasn't a delay, we would expect to see a none. So then back to your question of if the national schematron rules um, exist, do you have to have them in the state system? Um, for me, that's a twofold question of as a user interface, there are some software systems that are that they're being transformed so that as one enters that patient care report, um, they're, they've been rebuilt, rewritten. Um, so that it works in the system. Uh, but if the national schematron file um, was, was built into the system such that at the time a record is closed, the PCR was generated as an XML file, and it was validated first against our XSD, second against the national schematron files, and then third against the state schematron, then the answer would be no, wouldn't be needed. Josh, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I'll just, uh, you know, to kind of restate it, uh, if um, if a constraint is in the national XSD, it does not need to be in your state schematron file uh, because the validation yes. will fail XSD validation and it won't even be validated through schematron files because it failed XSD first and it stops there. Uh, if um, a constraint is an error or a fatal in the national schematron files, uh, then it does not need to be in your state schematron file because it should fail at that point uh, at the national schematron level before it even runs your state schematron validation. If it's a warning in the national schematron file, but you want it to be an error or a fatal at the state level, then you do need to have that in your state schematron file with that higher level of um, severity uh, on it. So as you're setting up your system, uh, you may have a kind of a native validation rules interface in your state system. And uh, as you're setting up those rules, you may set up rules that are necessary for the user interface of your state system for those that are direct users. But if those rules are simply duplicating something that's in the national schemas, um, then you don't need to export those rules into your state schematron file. You're just setting them up for, for direct users benefit in your state system. But someone using another vendor product is going to have those same rules set up in their vendor product because they are national rules that everyone needs to set up. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. 
He says that so much more smoothly than me. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. So I'm going to go back um, now and talk. Um, so Sharon Steele is asking the question, what is the difference between error and fatal? Um, Josh, can I have you answer that question? Sure. Uh, the difference between error and fatal only matters when there's um, uh, a data submission that contains multiple records in it. So let's say someone uploads uh, um, a file that contains 10 patient care report records. Uh, if there's a fatal failure, that entire file is rejected by the receiving system. So none of the 10 records will be imported in that system, uh, even if the failure was just in one particular record. We usually use fatal rules in the national files for stuff that might be in the header of the file, because you know if there's something wrong in the header, then we really can't understand how to process any of the patient care reports in the file. Um, but at the, at the national level, we're, we're setting almost, you know, that there's very few fatals. We set error level rules. Error level rules say if you've got 10 patient care reports in the file and there's an error in one of those patient care reports, then that report is rejected by the receiving system. But the other nine reports, if they don't have any errors, they could still be accepted and processed by the receiving system. So, uh, and then just to add to that, warning means uh, you'll issue a warning, but the receiving system still must accept the data, even though there's that warning there. Uh, so I would say uh, the use of fatal should be really rare. Um, you would want to use error so that you're rejecting things at a record level or a patient care report level rather than a whole batch of PCRs. And then uh, warnings will be useful as you introduce new validation rules that you want people to see them, but you don't want to stop, you don't want to create um, a barrier to data submission. And people get used to seeing that warning, they adjust their behavior, and then maybe later you escalate it up to an error. Uh, although in some cases you always keep it as a warning because there are valid exceptions to the rule. And then Ann just asked, do vendors sending files to state systems get messages back when sending a file or do they need to actively check? Um, when they submit via web services, they get what's called a response handle or request handle. Um, basically a numeric code gets uh, given back to them immediately when they submit data. Uh, then the state system starts processing their data and they can use an operation um, that is a request status and submit that same uh, ID number back to the state system to request a status update for the processing of that submission. And once the state system is finished processing the data, then they'll get full um, diagnostics of that processing. So they'll see if it failed XSD validation, uh, if it failed schematron validation, uh, or past schematron validation. Either way, they'll see a list of all of the, um, the failed assertions uh, on that submission. So they get full diagnostics about what happened. But they do need to actually check for that status update because the state system may take several minutes or even hours to process the data and they've got to wait till it's done. And I am just showing the, um, the submit handle codes that a web service system can send back and this is just a small uh, list of those codes ab um, about you know, what happens initially uh, when that file is submitted. Um, and you just asked another question. Do they get messages back on warnings? Yes, they do. Karen, you sounded disappointed that I keep asking questions. No, 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 no. No, I just hadn't read it yet. And asked another question. No, no, I hadn't read it yet. Shame on me. I like the questions. So originally he's asking the question, uh, and I appreciate this. I think this is a great way for you guys to ask the questions. Uh, saw error if the same file is submitted two times, our users need to do this often. Originally, can you expand on that? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I wasn't sure if you could hear me. Um, I just mean, like, we have users will resubmit files, like something, they'll fix something, and they'll resubmit the, you know, the same batch of, of reports. 
um, to fix something. And so we'll get this, you know, pretty much the same file over, over and over and again while they're trying to fix a particular something about it. Yep. So obviously right now you're talking about um, what you're seeing in version two. And so your question yeah. is how is that handled in version three? Um, I guess so, yeah. Um, so, so the the first key is um, is that certain information needs to be this the same. Um, so, for example, let me open up. Let me close this thing first. Um, you guys might not have seen that, but I did. Oops. So what I want, what I'm doing right now, at least for the moment, is I'm I'm going to a couple of pieces of information within the standard. So, um, patient care report number can't change. What we're um, and I'm going to talk about some of the other elements that can't change in order for that record to be updated. Uh, but yes, in essence, the record can be updated. What we're seeing, um, and Josh and Ann. Uh, Doug and Sharon, Jay, um, you may be able to share, um, Jay less, <laughs> um, but you may be able to share what you're seeing uh, or have heard what's happening for you, specifically your third party submitters. Um, um, but certain information can't change. So one of those things is patient care report number. Obviously another one is EMS agency number. Uh, some of the other things have to do with times, uh, but we have some pieces of the submission where we're saying you have to submit the agency number, um, incident number, response number, can't change, um, and within times. So let's say, and, and I can share with you, um, Jay, Jay Ospie has shared in the, in the past, because I shared it with him, that we've got a call from Wyoming that happened in 2026, calendar year 2026. Um, so this, they could go back and update that um, that unit notified by dispatch date. However, we'll receive that that PCR as a new record because this is one of our linking um, elements. So as long as the our, the key elements that make it a unique record don't change, yes, all that data can be resubmitted um, as many times as one wants. Um, Josh, okay, can you it's, it's, um, can it's you the share some now? Same as it is now. Josh, do you want to add anything about what you're seeing specifically in Oregon? I'll just add that uh, XML schema and schematron validation are unrelated to this question. So um, when the record is submitted, it's either valid or not according to the validation. Once it's determined to be valid, then it gets processed into your state system, and that's a matter of um, the policy within your state system as to how you'll handle a record okay. that you've previously received, you know, are, are you going to reject it because you already have it, or are you going to go ahead and process it and update the existing record? Of course, I recommend processing it and up, updating that record. Um, but yeah, that's that's the process that happens after validation has been passed. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Everybody else probably already hey. understood that. No, it's a great question. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of make that distinguish that distinction. Okay, so Mike Rockard is asking the question, is there a list where it shows all the elements that cannot be changed when submitting to the state system or the national system? Uh, you know, we actually need to create a document that uh, indicates that. So I'm going to ask Laurel or Clay if they can also make a note about that. Carl, Laurel I think Bader. that already exists on your site. Well, I'm sure it does, but I don't know that it exists in a um, – I think it's, it's in uh, the data submission, uh, the onboarding yeah, document. It, it's got the national and state required elements, I think, on your site so that you can download as an Excel sheet. Right, but I don't think it lists the, what our, our, um, the elements are that make our – what we refer to as our PCR hash – that I did oh, cool. that's a PCR key. So I'll have to do that. Um, we'll have to create a document and may, maybe, sh you know, share some additional information. Because we also have that for the demographic data set. Yeah, 
Yeah, and at the state level, I've always recommended simply using the combination of the agency number and the PCR number, and uh, that that's the unique key. But I can tell you that right now, anybody who's in ImageTrend state, um, ImageTrend right now is using, unless they've done something different, um, they had shared with us that they are using the exact same um, PCR hash that the Nemesis TAC is. Um, so I think that's some questions that need to just be uh, talked about with this, with each state vendor to see if it's being handled differently. Printer Josh, I have a quick question. Um, this is Scott from Colorado. Yeah. Regarding um, validation, because I know schematrons are created from validation. Um, the challenge that we face is data quality because there are so many different software vendors within the state. Uh, we don't have any custom elements, and we use, obviously, the schematron that we publish uh, to Nemesis. Is version 3 better about, I guess, mapping or data quality because all those different software vendors still have to meet the schematron that we publish onto Nemesis. Therefore, it should map correctly when it comes to you guys. Now, I don't know if it will when it goes to image trend is my only problem, but theoretically, they should all be the same coming to you. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, or to the Nemesis TAC, I'll say. I, I work on contract with the Nemesis TAC, so yeah. they receive the data. But um, yeah, so Nemesis 3 is um, uh, a more um, comprehensive schema than Nemesis 2 was, uh, just even at the XSD level. There, it's a lot tighter at the XSD level. Nemesis 2 never had schematron validation as part of the standard. So uh, Nemesis 3 has that additional advantage at the national <laughs> level that we can have schematron files um, that are implemented in every system across the nation uh, that were published by the Nemesis tax. So they're implemented the same way everywhere. Um, then you've got that additional value of being able to make your state schematron file so that if you have rules that are specific to your state, you can get those out to those local systems and um, they can perform that validation before they even send the data to you. So uh, really you, you should see very little in the way of rejected data at the state system level um, because the local system shouldn't even try to send it to you if they've run validation locally and saw that it failed. Uh, so you should see much cleaner, you know, kind of a much cleaner pipe from local to state to national in Nemesis 3. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It does. Um, it definitely does. That, and that's been the biggest complaint out of anyone, even in the provider community or agency community, is the data is so skewed they may say they ran 400 calls and I have them at 350. I'm hoping version three will basically eliminate variability that exists with the different software vendors. Yeah, and you know, in that particular question, it's still a tough one because uh, let's say they, at the local agency level with a local vendor, um, you know, they filled out 400 patient care reports, but um, 20 of them never passed validation, so they never sent them to the state. Well, the, the agency needs to do something about that. They need to fix those reports until they do pass validation so they can be sent to the state. Um, that's, in fact, where the demographic data comes in really handy because they should be submitting an annual update to you in demographic data, or, or more, more than annually, but at least annually, where they have their annual stats in there that say, in 2016, we had this many patient contacts, we had this many um, uh, uh, dispatches of our agency and then at the state level you can now compare here's what they said they did and here's what we actually received from them does everything match right. up and if not then you can have that conversation about hey guys you know you said you did 400 but we only got 380 do you have some reports that maybe you didn't finish or that they didn't pass validation and they're just sitting there in your system can we help you to, to fix that perfect made some changes. Therefore, we're having to republish our schematron, uh, which I've spoken to Karn about previously. Um, we're doing that, and it's more—it's likely we're going to have to do it again towards the end of the year because the hospitals open here like gangbusters. So that's just something we're going to have to face. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
one side note on that, when you publish updates through the Nemesis repository, uh, all of that history is tracked. So that's especially useful for vendors where if, if they get out of sync with you, they can look at the actual history and say, oh, the state updated this two weeks ago. That's why we're, you know, we haven't caught this update yet. Or, wow, they've updated it three times in the last year. Okay, well, you know, and we're going to grab the latest update. Thanks for your help. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Um, so, so I did a couple things. So, as as, um, as you guys saw me bringing things up here uh, in the webinar, so Josh most recently referenced that uh, the fact that the demographic um, data includes statistical uh, data that ha has been submitted. So, um, if you've already received, for example, 2016 data, um, Scott. So here's here's where that inform what that information looks like, at least within version three. Um, and even as you get started in your system, you you could say, okay, what were your 2015 statistics? Or again, your 2016 statistics. Um, let's get that information as a starting point um, so we know what you have. Um, I, you know, obviously taking a look at that, you know, sooner rather than later um, can help determine if you've seen a, you know, a drop that if if you're able to know that historically this agency had you know 5000 calls a month and you and obviously if you only received 2000 yep there there's an issue that might be happening there um, so it's also knowing who your agencies are and what their what their call volume is so you can track it over time um have some trends and we we did help with that at least in version 2 that we had a a, a dashboard that showed um, counts over time and, and it was colored uh, showing if there was a drop in records uh, by month. The yeah, other when I was a thing state data manager, I, I used both monthly and annual trending for, uh, to look if there was any variability in the agency's data that was um, kind of, you know, out of norm. Um, so that's good for catching variability where you see a sudden drop off in the number of records and you know, ah, you know, something changed. Maybe they updated their system and something broke. Um, however, if you're seeing consistency month to month and year to year, um, then you're not going to see anything from a trend report that'll, that, that alerts you to the fact that you may not have all the records from that agency. Perhaps they have a, a steady number of patient care reports that don't get completed or don't get sent or don't get uh, don't become valid every month, you know, and and so everything looks consistent, and that's where these annual stats can help. Where you can say, okay, wait a minute, we we have less than what you say we should have. Let's take a look. Um, so I'm going to go back to a, a question. I think that you also asked God, or at least in, in general had been questioned, was um, this the schematron rules, who that's displayed to. So this is the data submission report. Um, so I'm logged in as me, which means I can see all the states that are submitting data to us. Um, and for those of you who didn't hear, Rhode Island is now submitting. Um, so, you know, we've increased another state, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, but as a state, once you're submitting data, you have access to this report. Um, and as a, as a state, you're able to look at it and say, okay, what's the software package that's being submitted? Is there a specific version? Who's the EMS agency number? And then you can look at a specific date range. And, and then uh, what we do with this particular dashboard is we say, okay, here's the average violations per PCR by element. So, of course, I'm looking at a national picture right here as opposed to a specific state. And uh, we can see here that um, at least in this current 30-day um, period, um, it's eResponse.09, which should be one of the delay elements. Um, just thinking off the top of my head. Um, and then you as a, as a state, you're able to look at um, EMS agencies and this is ordered from high to low. So again, in a specific date range, uh, you're able to see which agency has the highest number of violations. Um, we also show it by a by a map. And um, Doug and Sharon, I don't know if you want to share that. You know, when when Nebraska uh, first started submitting, so this is average violations per PCR. And and keep in mind, so here, for example, 
um, we could look at the – in fact, let's just do it. I, we can look at just oh, – it looks like I chose um, two days. Um, so I just highlighted over those two days this entire report is updating. And then looking at January 4th and 5th, you'll notice that there's more green, which means those are PCRs without violations, and orange are the PCRs with violations. So obviously there's less PCRs with violations on these two days than on uh, January 18th and 19th. Um, but when Nebraska first started um, submitting data, they were also able to drill down and look at a specific incident zip code and time of day, day of week, uh, to see when uh, there were larger violations, again, per PCR. So this isn't obviously going to show anything if there is not any um, violations. And every now and again, we get that as well. Um, and this is going to continue to update, and it will go from this light gray to a darker black. But we also show um, at a national level, so we show you the schematron patterns, because we have at a national level, um, when Josh worked with us uh, based on the NISEMSO Data Managers Council, who said these are the elements we want rules for, um, Josh took those rules um, those um, recommendations, put them into patterns, um, and so these are the patterns. Up above were some elements, and then here are um, the warning messages that also um, list out the some of the elements that may play a role um, in what triggered a specific um, a specific message. So um, again, I. I, um, I made it a little change in here, so let me just try to get this so we can't see who somebody is. Um, the largest one in this case is ePatient16. I'd have to go look at that. I'm thinking maybe it's ethnicity. Does anybody want to look? Okay, I'll look. Let's just, let's just, I, have, I really haven't seen, um, oh, it's age units. No, it's, yep, age units. That's a first one. I hadn't really seen that one uh, before as a, as a big issue, so that would be interesting to you know find out if that's a specific agency, a specific software um, that's responsible for that. Um, in general, you can take a look at average violations by software package. This number over here is always going to be one, uh, but it just allows you as a as a state to say maybe if there was an update provided. Um, to us that a software is being used now that there might be one version of a software that's responsible for more uh, schematron violations than another but we have we offer reports to you with regards to um, schematron violations but only at the national level you would have your own reporting tools within your own state system for your state rules questions on that even though I just moved it off to the side Um, so, Mike, you had uh, made a comment, worrisome that we would use annual data to go back and find the orphaned reports. Um, do you want to expand on that at all or just a simple statement? Well, what I was trying to aim at was, early, you know, a few minutes ago when we were discussing that when they submit their demographic data and they say, oh, well, we submit 10,000 runs a year, all right? But when we check, we only show 9,000. And going back to that provider and say, hey, you're missing 1,000 runs. Do you understand what I'm getting at there? Yep. Well, and, that's going to vary from state to state. Okay. All right. In my opinion, it's going to vary state to state. Um, so we only have 10 minutes left. So I want to I do two more things. Um, so, um, so the – other piece that I had mentioned, um, and I had sent another email what, early last week that talked about um, some concern that I had about the fact that uh, some, there are some schematron rules that are being requested or are part of a state that are fatal rules, um, that the information is not available to the vendor. Um, and an example of that is destination codes. So what I want to show you, again, I'm, I'm referencing Michigan because they've provided us the information. So if I go all the way down towards the bottom of, of the Michigan rules, you'll see that there 
uh, schematron rules, they do have a fatal rule that says submitted value for the destination code edisposition02 does not exist in the system. Now, if I click on these three dots, we can actually see the rule. So the rule that exists lists just a handful of codes. Um, and uh, yesterday, Kevin was uh, shared that anything that begins with a 26, which is the state identifier, um, is a, a facility that is in Michigan. And then there are some other codes um, that are for, for some of the other neighboring states, um, hospital f facilities and such. And then if I go back to the Michigan State Dataset file, and you, if you noticed this, this before, there's 1,700 facilities. And you can see that um, there's hospitals. Here's the name of the hospital. I'm going to get rid of the address. I'm just going to deselect the address. Uh, I'm Just because we don't need it, I'm going to deselect the zip code. But I'm just going to keep the state, the city, the location code, and just the, um, the type here. Uh, but what he's also done is reached out to the state, gotten where possible the actual state code uh, that, the, that the state EMS office is using for specific facilities. And he has uh, included those in his list of facilities. And also, they are also correspondingly available within um, in the Schematron file. So the good thing here is that we have the resources um, that are going to position the software companies that operate in the state of Michigan to, um, to meet the needs of this fatal uh, Schematron rule for eDisposition02. Um, there are other state systems um, that we have not yet received that documentation. Uh, and so what is happening, and you guys um, who are active already know that there are software companies that reach out to you and say, hey, do you have this yet? Do you have this yet? Um, and um, sometimes then they contact the NEMSYS TAC as well. So I would just like to you know, just reiterate, it would be really great uh, and helpful, not just for the NEMSYS TAC, but more importantly for the software companies that operate in each state, to develop a state data set file um, that has um, as much of this information that, as pertinent to your state. Uh, the big ones from my perspective, particularly if you don't have custom elements, is listing state required elements, the certification licensure levels that are allowed to operate um, on the ambulances within your state, providing a list of EMS agencies and facilities. Those are my big four. Uh, there's obviously huge value as well if you have a state that um, provides statewide protocols or if you have state law that says certain um, certification levels are only allowed to administer certain medications or perform certain procedures. Karin, this is Doug in Nebraska. How does all this data get into um, NIMSIS? So that it's available as I'm walking through this right here? Yes. Um, there's a couple of ways that it can be provided. Uh, I did recently receive a state data set file uh, from a state who received it from ImageTrend. Um, we did load it, or I did load it and, and looked at it in a preview state, and there was some information missing. Um, this particular state is working to correct that information now. Um, so you could um, work with your state vendor to see if they have the capabilities of creating a state data set file, in essence, from what you may have already uh, have available within your state system. If you don't, this is where under on the NEMSIS website, under Reporting Tools, Reports, State Reports, then you actually have to scroll past the dashboards that we make available to you and go to the version 3 state data set builder. Um, and many of you may be aware um, that in the past, uh, Josh did a uh, presentation, so it was May of 2015, and there's some additional 
um, enhancements that have been made to this tool uh, since this webinar. So, Josh, we probably need to do a new training session, huh? Uh, you yeah, or me? I guess you're right. We'll, we'll do it together. We'll get that scheduled. Um, or at least we can do a, a training video so we get that up there. Um, also, there's a, a, a user guide on how to use it. But here, the key, of course, is is clicking onto this state data set builder. And so for the purposes of this, I am going to be one of the, I will be the U.S. Minor Outline Islands because, of course, um, we don't get any data from them. <clears throat> but as a, so how this works is I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus real quickly at least on um, some of the simple ones that I mentioned. So state required elements. If I, when I click on state required elements, uh, it brings up this message. And again, Josh created this um, for us. And one can do a number of things. You can say, oh, well, we're going to be collecting all of the elements. So if I clicked on all, every single one of these check boxes off to the left, um, or boxes would be filled with a check mark. If I just did national, only those with the red um, would have a check mark in it. If I did state, anything that has the gold, uh, the boxes would have a check mark in it. You can also import a list. So if you have worked, for example, um, with a, another state and and you know you're going to do something similar to what that state um, has done, you can actually load their elements. So if somebody said, well, what Michigan has is what I want, plus or minus a few things. So you could literally click on Michigan where it says, and then the system is going to grab their information and say they've got 68 demographic elements, 233 um, EPCR elements, you click um, import. And you might say, well, wait a second, as a state, I'm not doing any of the custom elements. You can go in here, deselect those. I'm just going to scroll down to some other things and deselect some a few things. Um, so you might say, or add some things, forgive me here. Um, so you might want some additional injury information. For example, you might want um, protective equipment um, that was used by a person who was injured on the job. Um, so you can make some, some additions. Or you can go through each one manually. You may have a committee you worked with already and you can just go through and click on these. Uh, EMS agencies, you can manually put in um, a code, or there is an Excel spreadsheet under this more information. You can create an Excel spreadsheet uh, that lists your agency unique state ID and agency number. These might be the same thing, or they might, um, you know, have a kind of a parent-child relationship to those. Uh, most states, they're the same thing, uh, but you can create. You can download the Excel spreadsheet. It needs to be in this format in order to upload the data. If you don't have a lot of facilities, so I'm clicking on facilities now, but if you don't have a lot of facilities, but you know a hospital, um, so what I'll do at the moment is I'll choose University of Utah. Would help if I did this correctly. And I can't spell, oh, it's because I'm under pressure. Oh, here it is, University of Utah Hospital, right? So here it is. I click on that, and all of the address information fills out and phone number. Um, all I'd have to do is say it's a hospital. I could put in the code, Utah 004, um, and whatever it is. If I know what the designations are, they could be there. Um, all this information, then if I click on this preview button, it opens it up. And you can actually take a look at it, what this would look like to um, to users. But this is this is in essence is how it can be done manually. Uh, but also, if I go back to um, the state information, there's an Excel spreadsheet that can be downloaded. My only caveat to this is that the the Excel spreadsheet is a little misleading. Uh, because you have to use an actual code, um, such as the city code. You can't just say the city is Salt Lake City. It wouldn't, it wouldn't load. Um, 
you actually have to use the code, and this is a civil code for Salt Lake City, and you have to have the code for a specific county and so on. Um, but this is how uh, this tool can be used either, you know, from the manual perspective. And the training, the training sessions and the user manual uh, provide a lot of help, and I'm happy to go over um, this again. We'll do another training session uh, directly on, on how to do that, and maybe we can have that be the, the February session is, is walk through um, building a state data set file. Michael asked, how important are the designation types, hospital designations? So the first question is, does your state require agencies to submit that information to you? Uh, if you do require it, then it's important for you to give it to the agency so they can set it up correctly in their systems. Uh, if you don't require that information to be submitted to you, then it's probably not so important uh, that you provide it to them in the first place. So that's, that's okay. how I would approach it. And let me just add, Add to that um, in that if in the e-disposition section, we also have an element that's called e-disposition hospital capability. So just a slight naming um, flex that's there. That's a good point. And that's a national element. So, yep. so what, one of the goals on, on this element, it's a, it's a single select element. So um, although a hospital might have a lot of capabilities, like, you know, a large system could have a, a STEMI 24-7 capability and might be a trauma center level two and they have a stroke, a stroke center and a rehab center and a pediatric, you know, might have multiple um, types of these services that they offer. But on a, uh, on a particular patient, um, one of the things that's asked of us all the time is, um, was a patient with severe trauma? Did they go to a trauma center? Did, is a, did a patient with a stroke go to a, a stroke center? Because, you know, there's all kinds of initiatives out there um, with, you know, taking trauma patients to um, the best facility or, or the facility that offers those services. Um, so that's the other reason why the designations are important. Um, Mike, you asked uh, one other question. I'll answer that and then our time is up. Uh, so you said for the facility list, is that where the GPS codes um, that we talked about need a lot of information? So the, so the answer is, is yes. It's a question, so that's these, right, right here. Yeah. So this one right here is the GPS. Um, this one is the um, national grid coordinates. Um, what's, and it's one of those things. Do you, if you as a state have that information, um, that information can be made available in a standard format to all of the vendors. If that information isn't important to you as a state, then you can leave it off. Just as, you know, national provider identifier, uh, this may or may not be something that, um, that you want. I mean, every physician, every clinic, um, has a national provider identifier. Hospitals usually have multiple NPIs um, within their, you know, across the hospital system. Um, so it's all dependent on what you want to provide as a state in a standard format to um, the EMS agencies in your state and the vendors that operate in your state. And if we upload the Excel file that, that we download, if, if we don't have those numerics in there, that won't create a problem when we send you the file. Is that correct? No, they would just be blank. So just the, um, so yesterday Good. I worked I worked with Texas. So let me see if I have my um, let's see. Um, so I made some some. So let me just show you. So this is the Excel spreadsheet that. The file that Texas originally provided to me uh, did not have the appropriate code, so let me show you kind of how this looks. So you would copy this in the Excel spreadsheet, so I kind of reformatted this already for them. So I can literally just click anywhere, anywhere in here, uh, hit paste, the information populate. So now I have to go back to it. Come on. And you'll notice that the information uh, populated uh, with 
um, everything that was in there. The original list of facilities that I received from Texas actually looked like this, in which the cities um, were listed and the counties with names. So this actually, um, most of this is going to fail. So let me just take a handful of these. I'll go to the end of this spreadsheet if I can find the end. I guess it'd be there. Um, so I've only taken a handful, but literally just find a, a cell to paste it. So you'll notice that what it's doing is it's, look, you guys, it's my dad's birthday today. Um, what you'll notice is we have some facility information. Please review the facility list. Fix anything outlined in red. So what it's doing for all of these is saying there's some errors in here. So now if you click in here, um, and this was might be my fault. This was probably my fault. I didn't open up the Excel spreadsheet far enough. Um, this actually might have been a city, um, but it still wouldn't have populated in here. But there's there's information that's that's wrong. Um, so I could, for example, clear this out, and it's not going to generate with um, city information or a zip code or county or country or state even because the format was incorrect. Oh, and and I didn't. It's true. I obviously did not open um, up one of the columns. So this is the other thing to be careful of is if you don't have all of the columns open in the spreadsheet, everything gets shifted. So I did make an error. So let me go back to this spreadsheet. And oh, see, here they all are that I did not have open. So let's just try this again with a, with a couple. So let's try this one more time. But I still have some issues. So here was Ward before, here's Ward now. So now you'll notice NPI is blank as it should have been. There wasn't any information in the, uh, in the suite or apartment number, but the address has come in. Um, but so Texas is wrong uh, here. And it's like you were still missing, uh, maybe it was the address two column after the first address column. There's so one I'm column still, still missing off. something. So if I was really smart, right? Probably dot, dot seven, somewhere in there. All right, so let's see. All right, let's just go all the way, click on hide. Thanks, Josh. Try it one more time, everybody. So I'm going to remove all facilities just like this really quick, just so we have a clean slate. So there's still some things wrong. So now uh, let's go into this other one. So this city, right, so what, what was in the Excel spreadsheet was free text. And so this has to be corrected. What the system is going to let me do is, um, and this was for Texas, so I'd have to uh, find Palestine, Texas, um, and that part updates. Um, but technically, this one should have been wrong. Um, in any case, oh, I might have fixed that part already. Um, but there are some things that if you upload it, it's going to tell you what, what is incorrect. But obviously, the key, as we saw, that Hey, I planned that, you guys. Um, you have to make sure all of the columns are visible so that when you do a copy and paste, uh, everything po uh, populates in the appropriate uh, section of, the, of this tool. And I'm always grateful. I don't know if you guys are. I'm always grateful for our developers because they make this magic happen, right? I have no idea why that Excel spreadsheet just allows me to paste it in there, but Josh did. Made that magic happen. Um, any other questions since we've gone, I've gone over by nine minutes already. So Karen, I don't, um, so, so in my last system, the agencies and facilities were all mixed up and then um, in my state system and then we had added some generic ones that um, were like morgues and things like that that people had asked for. So I just wondered what people were doing in version 3 with kind of those generic locations if they are 
adding something in there for for the those codes or if um yeah, we're we're seeing that for some folks. Um, I know that some have created a you know a generic private residence because there's still the option, um, and so all those would kind of go to other, because um, obviously the type of facility right now um, is primarily focused, well, is focused on healthcare facilities. So if you have a morgue or if you have a private residence um, or something like that, all those would have a a, a type of other. Um, but you could list them, and we have seen it. I'm trying to think which state has it, uh, and I just it's not coming to the top of my head which state I could go to right now and show you. Uh, but, yes, there are other states that are creating some generic uh, facility types so that when EMS documents treated, um, transported by this EMS unit, that when it when the patient is not always taken to a healthcare facility, that that can uh, that information can still come to you. Um, what about, Karen, like, for example, air services that maybe they're doing a one-off flight to a agency in Florida or something, or a hospital in Florida or something like that? Uh, how are people accommodating that? You, so you're saying the treated transferred uh, care? No, like, uh, for example, an air service, like sometimes they fly patients to Texas or... So you're saying they land at a um they land somewhere and the the flight crew might have to so they're in a fixed wing aircraft maybe and instead of landing at a hospital they have to land at an airport and then they're picked up and transported eventually to a hospital are you talking about that type of scenario I'm just yeah I'm just asking for yeah if they're going to submit that record to us um what people do if they have out of state hospital as a generic code or or how they kind of do well, as you saw with Michigan, Michigan has um, has tried to identify as many um, uh, neighboring hospitals as they can. If it's going to some others, um, I think um, some have. I know there are some states that have created just a generic out of state hospital. You know, kind of the whole not listed uh, doing a generic capture. So that they're so they are doing that. The other thing that I have seen is um, is again in the other category, uh, specifically knowing that e disposition twelve um, does allow for you to say treated uh, transferred care to another EMS unit. Um, you know, in the case that you're you know a BLS service is transferring to an ALS unit, or the scenario you indicated earlier with the with the helicopter service, you know, for a critical patient that your your started care um helicopter service lands, they take over care, you would still want to potentially list in e disposition e uh, e dis I can't say disposition. Um these two, <laughs> you might want to have that specific code for the ambulance service that um, received the patient from the either the first responder or for the uh, initial ambulance service that arrived on scene. So technically, you would be able to add um, into this EMS agency's list. Oops, I need to be over here. Um, you you in theory could have some some codes in here that says, um, or the EMS agency list could also be included in your facilities list, technically. But then it would only be filling out, you know, three pieces. It'd say type would be other, location code would be the, you know, D agency 02 code, and the name would be the name of the ambulance service. We have seen that. I'm yeah, I was just thinking that if you wanted to have a fatal rule for that, you probably need to have an out. So I was trying to think of what the most appropriate out would be. Um, yeah, well, then I think you need to have um, the – you could have within your rule, and I want to say one of the other states I saw did have one of the rules where it's requiring e-disposition 02. There are some if-then statements where it is saying, okay, let's look at the disposition. If the disposition is 
um, you know, is treated, transported by this EMS unit or any of the with transport um, value choices that only those codes could be used. And if you want to, you know, limit it to a hospital list, then where you could say where type of destination is, you know, one of these two. Um, so all of those things could potentially be added in that um, in that list of facilities. Yeah, we took that approach in Oregon state data set file. We also included the destination state as well. Um, Oregon only puts out a list of hospitals, so that's all that they care about the agencies really being standardized on ah. when they submit data. So when they're submitting data, the Oregon Schematron file says, if the destination state was Oregon and if the destination type was a hospital, then the destination code needs to be one of these codes on our, on our state data set list. Okay, Josh, drive me to where I'm going to see that. Yeah, let's um, go to the pattern that's uh, OR consistency EMS data set. Okay, hold on. Towards the bottom. There you go. Consistency. Yeah, that's and, the one. Uh, EMS okay, data. Okay. So and then scroll down to the bottom of that one. Okay, so there's that one. When a destination is a hospital in Oregon, then the destination code should be a hospital license number issued by the Oregon Health Authority. So uh, okay. several elements uh, interplaying there, uh, as opposed to just a simple, hey, the code has to be on this list. And Josh, you and I had talked about what the correlation could be between a Schematron file and a state data set file. Um, and as we see here, you're, act you're literally referencing your state data set and that and information that's in D facility in this schematron rule. So the schematron rules can be linked um, to the state data set file. Yeah, so on a technical level, we've embedded the state data set file inside of the schematron file. And so when we get to this rule here, we're doing a lookup against that published uh, state data set file list. So there's never a difference between uh, what Schematron is testing, and what the state has published as its facility list. That would probably be more something for your vendors, you know, to help you with, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of some under-the-hood stuff, but that's what we've done in Oregon. Thanks, Josh. Obviously, we need to have a to-be-continued uh, session in February. Um, I would ask that if people have some questions, further questions about this, uh, thoughts, concerns, uh, if you'd please email me, uh, me and Josh, uh, and then you know we'll work together and see what the training session will be for February. Again, I think both of us are more than happy to have another session um, sooner than you know, quote unquote, four weeks from today. Um, so please let us know and we can have another session, you know, in mid-February um, to cover this. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, happy Chinese New Year this weekend.